and go. All right, so tonight, uh, everybody, we're gonna talk about the importance of packets and, and security forensics. So I'm glad to hear that there's gonna be a Wireshark class coming out hosted by Steven, so that means that at least some people are taking packet security uh, seriously, right? Um, a little bit about me. Yeah, that is me surfing in a nice bar. Uh, 20 years in the network in uh, security performance, forensic analysis space, also 20 plus years in the Army. Uh, so some of that time has converged. Uh, obviously, I am not in anymore. I've retired, uh, hence the, the hair. Um, and for the last six years, as you can see on the bottom, I also am a part-time professional bee wrangler. So uh, the raised honeybees, and the hardest part is branding them all. That's the last one branding. Really, really, really tough. All right, so if anybody wants to know anything about honey out of this, please ask me your bees. I know a little bit about them. Um, it still hurts to get stuck. All right, so I wanted to start off talking about the power of and. Um, just like to add a little, little bit of levity and stuff to the presentations. I know they can drag on, especially after everybody's had a belly full of uh, food and then put down some downers, so I'm looking for some tired eyes. So let's talk real quick about the power of and. One of the most important words, I think, in the English language. And we'll talk about how that relates to us tonight. Um, but and, right? I always, I always like to point out to my kids, what have you done today? Ask them every day. So what have you done today? What did you do? Actually, I say, what did you do today? I typically say it like that. What did you do? I went to school and did this. Okay, and, 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 and half the time I get something that they did bad. They just confess, right? So they didn't even ask them what they did wrong. I just asked them, and. Uh, we also use it in a lot of other things, right? Potato chips, right? Take plain potato chips, they're great. Typically have salt on them. But what about salt and vinegar, right? Salt and vinegar is a lot better. So we got that salt and, but there's also salt and something else. I always like salt and something else. So my favorite and out there, especially when it re relates to salt, salt and pepper. Because what's salt without the pepper? Right. <laughs> They don't really push it. Uh, so tonight we'll talk about our pepper. Our pepper is going to be packets in, in network security forensics, right? So we'll talk about the pepper, the and. That's going to be us. All right. So today in security, typical security, right? We build these massive defenses out there that are great. Right? These beautiful massive defenses of IPSs, IDSs, DLPs, web access firewalls, etc. It's all out there. And life is good in the kingdom. It's fantastic especially when we're dealing with what they're made to defend against, right? You get our crossbows, catapults, maybe some guys with some bows and arrows, some swords, maybe for those of you who don't know, the, the uh, nefarious Trojan rabbit from Monty Bucks on the Holy Grail. Great for defending, walls are great for defending against those kind of, of threats, those nefarious things out there. But what happens when we have to defend against this? Your cannon, which in case you didn't know, it's not the ball that destroys the wall, it's the big bang it makes, right? Cannons go bang. Those walls weren't designed to stop those cannons. They aren't designed to stop this person you see right here. That's actually my, uh, my oldest son. He's uh, getting more and more into computers, and I, I would bet one day he's going to try to do nefarious things just to see if he can do it. There are those people out there that, you know, as they say in the Batman movie, there's those guys that just want to see the world burn. They don't care about the money. They just want to see if they can do it. But also, what about those insiders, right? That guy who tried to take the stapler away from him for the last three years. That's probably the worst one, right? When he knows Milton from office space. Stapler. Um, those walls defend nothing against that because he's already passed them. That guy's already passed that wall and in the network. Uh, I was talking with a, uh, an actual customer today, healthcare provider, and he was talking about they need to revamp and are currently revamping their, their security policies. Because if you're a contractor and you get access to that network, that trusted network, you can literally go anywhere. Oh, and by the way, they can see where you've gone, maybe what you've done, but they can't see exactly what you've done. They know, you know, through whatever, we're gonna go back and pull the, the uh, LDAP blocks, right? We're gonna, we're gonna go pull back some, some access blocks. Yeah, I know this person touched the server and three gigabits of data came off of it, three gigabytes of data. What did he really pull? Yes, there was some not so important information on there, but there was a whole lot of important information. Uh, we'll, we'll see in a minute how we may or may not be able to see that. But, but again, if that person has access, how do I know exactly what they did? Maybe I think they did, maybe they didn't. Uh, I know I, I was reading recently about a lawsuit that Google has going on with Uber, where Google is suing 
a person who used to work at Google that went to work for another company called Auto that Uber bought, well, happened to do with Google's self-driving car program, they believe that user stole over 10,000 different documents. But they have no way to prove it down to the level of exactly which documents that person took. They know they access very critical servers. Auto started doing very similar stuff to what Google was doing shortly after. And now it's Uber's problem. So how do we know exactly what was happening? So what does that mean when we're having to defend against this? Well, those castle walls crumble, right? They come down. We now have a way to get data out, whether it's through the wall, over the wall, under the wall. Technologies change, our defenses need to change. And we can't just think about protecting that perimeter. We can't just think about protecting the inside as well. We need a backstop for what's happening, something we can go to for the truth. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, I know you're all concerned about security and, and there's different reasons why. We'll talk about a few that I think are important. Uh, and by the way, guys, I like to keep these interactive, if you can't tell. Um, try to be a little, little lively. So if there are any questions, please just shout them out and I'll either yell at you that you're stupid or answer your question, right? I, I never do that. There's, only, there's no dumb questions, just dumb people. <laughs> all right, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, right? Um, all right, so, so, you know, I've got a lot of analytics in here. We'll talk about um, so, some reasons why they're important, but why are we concerned about security? Well, I'll, I'll use some older data right here. Um, cost of data breaches is just going up and up, right? This, this is a data point from back in 2016. The numbers are actually higher now. Um, 6.3 million to over 7 million just in 2016, so that was two years ago. That's obviously going up at this point in time, right? And that's just in the U.S. All right, my next one. And I obviously put these not come up where I wanted to, so that's not my top one. Uh, cyber crimes cost the global economy over 450 billion, again, back in 2016. I've got some newer stuff coming up, don't worry, so it's not all that data. But a pretty, pretty big number. IT threats continue to escalate in frequency and type, right? Perimeter breaches, just as I said, inside jobs are on the rise. And what are we all asked to do as security teams? How many, how many people's teams are getting larger and larger every day? A couple? How many are getting smaller and smaller over time? A couple? Are we getting, how many people are having to do more and more, whether they're getting larger or smaller? How many people are lying by not raising their hands right now? <laughs> all right, all right. I know we're security, we're, none of us want to admit if we've been breached or whatever, and that's fine, we'll talk about that. But uh, no, it, it's everywhere. It's not just on the security side, it's in the networking teams, the applications teams. We're all being asked to do more and more with less and less, whether that's our teams are increasing, but our workload is increasing at the same time, right? So automation becomes paramount to what we're doing here uh, on the security side, okay? Uh, negative financials, right? Negative financial states uh, if things happen. Who remembers the Experian incident? Yeah. Now everybody? Nobody? Who doesn't know about the experience? Let's put it that way. So I assume everybody does. I still talk about it all the time, right? Um, 48 million plus users potentially affected. That's some pretty bad PR right there and some, some ill will having to come out because we had to say something about a security. So we had to potentially say everything was potentially lost because we don't know what was actually lost because we don't have the fidelity of that data in the back end, right? Um, just, I'm from Atlanta. Well, that's where I live. I'm not from there, but that's where I live. Nobody's from Atlanta. Lives here. Um, City of Atlanta just had a, a ransomware attack. I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, it was, it's pretty massive. I think it's still somewhat going on. It, it was so bad that people couldn't even come in and pay with cash for their water and electric bills to the city or the, the water and sewer bill to the city, at least, or property taxes. Um, they had to either pay by check or by check or or wait until everything was fixed. Um, they didn't have the, the means of the computer system. It just was down, so they, they couldn't take cash. They couldn't even process cash. What they were doing with the checks, they were stapling them to their bill and filing them until when their systems came up so that they could then enter at that time. Um, it's pretty bad. Uh, Panera Bread just had an incident as well. They just lost at least 10,000 records, which may or may not have contained any PII or PCI information. They don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, we can just keep going on and on and on. So let's talk about some of the facts here regarding this, right? Whether you want to believe it or not, and this number is probably higher, 51% of organizations across the globe that have been affected by a global or by a data breach in the last five years. So, who all here has been affected by a data breach? Let's see. 
Oh my God, that's more than I thought. Would, I thought nobody would raise their hands right now, for sure. Uh, that wasn't quite half, but you know, we won't say, but you know, on average, at least a little more than half of this room has been affected by data breaches within the last five years. Um, the average cost, and, the, and these are 2018, 2017, 2018 numbers now, average global cost is about $3.6 million per breach with an average of 24,000, just over 24,000 records taken. So records, things that, are, that contain that PCI, that PII type information. The cost of that here in the United States is on average $225 per record. So you guys quickly do the math. It starts to add up on average, right? Now that's an average. Does anybody want to guess what the highest value record is? I'm sure some of you know. Healthcare. Healthcare. Do you know what the average cost of a healthcare record loss is? It varies based on the report. I've heard closer to 400 now. I've heard closer to 400. What's the least? Anybody want to guess what the least is? Credit card. No, no that's one of the second highest valuable. What's, the, what's one of the least? It's, it's one of the least useful or they sorry if anybody here works for the state government or federal government. The government type records are typically the, the, the least, around 70 to $80 in the US. Um, but that varies all over the place, right? Exactly what was taken and what was in the record. Um, but pretty interesting stuff. Now, the next line, the mean time to identify an attack, this is a number that varies greatly depending on who, who you've heard from. It's actually come down a little bit. Um, but from what I've heard, this is a pretty accurate number, about 191 days just to even know somebody's on the network doing something wrong before even discover an attack is happening. That's an incredibly long time. And that's the average. Um, I just recently, well, I'm talking about that now. I was recently at a, a power company in Georgia, um, big energy provider, and We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about having capture. It's a good spot to put this. Their CEO just mandated they go to 365 days worth of full length packet packet capture on their egress links from the network. <laughs> it's a pretty massive amount of data, but his mandate was, by God, if the average, he said 180 days at the time, he said, by God, I want to know for a fact we've seen anything that's come or gone from our network. Because we're not just dealing with the average hacker that's looking for a little bit of money. We're dealing with nation state actors that are potentially shutting down the power grid and causing larger and larger issues, right? So it, it's, just, it's a big issue to see what's going on. Now, not only is it taking that long to detect a problem, but once we detect to contain that entire attack, on average, it's about 66 days to fully remediate, contain that attack, right? So it can take a while. Um, I know a couple companies in this region, <coughs> being the southeast that are still working on some some issues they discovered that, that they were hit pretty hard on or they were full on down for a while so it's a it's a pretty big thing um this next one i want, I want to shift to the cloud a little bit who has not moved anything to the cloud who has no users that use any service in the cloud out there today everybody okay. at least we recognize that uh, does anybody want to guess what the average number of services an enterprise uses in the cloud today. An average enterprise, the number of services their enterprise uses today in the cloud. 47. It's a little over a thousand. It's a little over a thousand. And I've got some numbers there on in some slide notes. I'll find in a second that break that down a little bit by uh, by division. But yeah, over a thousand services in the web. And, and think about this. When I use one web service, it's not just that one web service I use. For example, for, for Viavi, we use Salesforce.com, cloud service for customer relationship management, right? Well, Salesforce.com also uses cloud services as a part of their service. They use Google Documents. They use AWS Storage for storing those customer records. So suddenly this list starts expanding and expanding and expanding. Of where, where does my data actually live in the cloud? I'm with Azure. Is all my data in Azure? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, that comes down to our next point here. So, Almost 18% of files in, the inter in enterprise sanctioned clouds, right, where we know we have data in the cloud. It's not shadow IT or, or you know, Martha in accounting who's gone out and said, well, I want to start using this uh, cloud serviced HR system instead of an internal one because our internal one's performance is terrible. Um, these are actually enterprise sanctioned cloud apps. 17.9% of these files have policy violations. Policy, like actual policy violations whether that's HIPAA, PCI, GDPR. Who's heard of GDPR in here? 
General, <laughs> never heard of it? Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, so pretty big thing coming down. Um, so, so that's a lot of files that have issues, and one, of five, one in five of those files is actually shared publicly. So if I just knew the URL, or did, did some crazy Google foo searching, I could potentially find that, that file. Now, breaking that down of that 18% of files in the, inter, in, the, in the cloud, almost 27% of those have PII violations, 24% have PCI, so again, PII things, social security numbers, right addresses, names, PCI credit card numbers. But the bigger one I thought was interesting is that last one there. 17% of those are either confidential or top secret documents. So I know there's some DOD defense people in here, but top secret and confidential documents somehow ended up in the cloud, or still do. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, those aren't supposed to come off a secret network, right? They're never supposed to leave it, but apparently somehow, some way, they are. And it's probably not from a hacker coming in through traditional ways, it's probably most likely an insider doing something, right? Doing something out there. But, but, but really interesting. Um, and then a third of all US companies should experience an attack between one to almost four million dollars in the next two years. So pretty big investment on just the cost, whether that's you know actual dollar damages, remediation costs, ill will, et cetera, all that, all that fits in there. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so this is kind of an eye chart here. Um, but we're gonna talk about what are some of those things that we can do that either increase or decrease the costs of a data breach on a per record basis. What you see to the right, where it's in, looks like positive numbers, that's actually a, dec a decrease in dollars in the cost per, per record taken during a data breach. And everything towards the bottom that you see going to the left there, that would be an increase in cost. Um, and, and there's a lot of different things in here, right? I mean, we see it at having a CISO appointed, right? That, that actually decreases the average cost by a little over $5 a record. Uh, what's interesting though, is when we start getting into things like, uh, where are we at here? Second from the bottom, extensive cloud migration. It's actually adding to the cost on a per record basis if you average it out of, of over $14, just because of the complexity. What's all touched? How long does it take? I mean, a lot of this is in, in the post forensics uh, investigation, right? Compliance failures, again, are we feeling GDPR? I bet this number is gonna skyrocket on that compliance failures here very soon. Um, you know, they, they, there, there's been a number of things, publications put out about specifically GDPR and how compliant cloud services are with regards to it. For those of you who may be somewhat familiar with GDPR, it's a, it's a bunch of European regulations uh, regarding data protection, right, and how fast we have to respond. Well, the fines are massive. On a per incident basis, it's, it's 20 million euros or up to 4% of your gross global Income as a company, yes, sir. So the third-party involvement there at the bottom is that the cost of third-party outsourcing your IT to third party, or is that the cost of once the breach happens, getting a third-party involved in resolving? Not oh, working. So the question was uh, the very bottom of third-party involvement. Does that include outsourcing your IT? Um, is, it, is it if you have hire a third party to come in and forensically investigate? It's a little of everything on that right. Obviously, the more outsourced we are, if it is IT, it's going to cost more. Okay. So it, it's, it's just there. Uh, absolutely. What I found interesting in this, though, is four, six, the sixth one from the bottom. Sorry, I don't have a pointer with me. I left it at home. Uh, it's a rush to notify. Rush to notify has about five and a half dollars on a per record basis. So if we're just trying to get our message out really quick, we don't know what's going on, we haven't investigated, but we had a problem. Right? Think experience, and, and I would say they, they went the, I'll get you in a second, they went the opposite way, because there's a couple of people that are being indicted right now and are probably going to jail for selling their stock options six months before they actually put it out. Uh, but, but just going out and saying, we have a breach, we don't know what it was, but we had a breach. Okay, that's great, you got it. At least you let us know. But what are they going to have to say that was a breach? Because of the data taken, didn't violate any compliance, right? That, that's where we're trying to get to, and we'll talk a little bit more on how we do that with packets. But if we, you know, sometimes being the first out of the gate isn't always the best, right? Um, Want to make sure we, we know what's going on. What is your source information? I will, uh, I don't have it. This one I don't have on my nose, I have it on my phone, which is at 1%, so I'll, I can get it to you after, after this, I'll give you the, the source for this one. Absolutely. 
I have it on listed on everything. I forgot to get it on this specific slide. Okay, it's a great slide. Yeah, no, it, it, it is. So, what one I want to talk about though um, are the top two. So, the top two are incident response team implementing a full incident response team. That includes not only having the team appointed, trained, knows what to do, right? But also the tools in place to actually do their job. Uh, a lot of times we skimp on tools. And then the second one, one second, I'll get you, uh, is extensive use of encryption. So I'll come back to those in a second. Yes, sir. Yes, how much would it decrease? How much would it affect the stock market? How much will? Would it affect the stock market? The stock market? Yes. Well, if I knew that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> the question was, how much would it affect the stock market? I, I'll tell you what, if I knew that, I'd, I'd be the wolf of Wall Street right now. And, and you'd be seeing me in a movie in about 20 years. Probably me in prison, but <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Yahoo, when they uh, got bought by Verizon, lost like 20 or 30 million dollars. It was estimated just because of their breach. Yeah, so, was that a, that's a statement, right? That's a fact. Yeah, a fact. Yeah, a fact. <laughs> so, I want to make sure there wasn't a question pin in there. So. No, the, the, the fact was that Yahoo got bought by Verizon and lost 20 million dollars because of the breach they had. Because of the breach they had. I, I, I think the key on that, that number, is how you measure it. If you measure it immediately after, there's a drop. But both Home Depot and Target are much higher post breach. And they really haven't done anything. What? Well, yeah, I didn't want to bring up Home Depot because I live right right by where Home Depot is and there I've got a lot of good friends over there. But they are they're still having an impact. There was just um, a couple weeks ago, maybe some maybe it was a couple months ago now, um, they just had to pay another $15 million as a part of the, their most recent breach. And it has to do with, they still they still don't even know what's necessarily going on, quite possibly, right? It's 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 the POS, I mean, for those, it's the, part of the problem is the POS systems that they don't necessarily own. Yeah, so, so you said part, part of the problem is the, the point of sale systems they don't even own. So that goes down here into that third party involvement, right? So think about that. Maybe it's a piece of the puzzle we don't own. It's that second and third cloud provider that we, shoot, we, I put it up in AWS on salesforce.com. How come Google Docs isn't as secure as it needs to be, right? Um, one of the things I, I've seen out there in a report saying that almost 90%, 89.9% of cloud services do not support data encryption at rest. The data is just sitting there. Right? Unencrypted on a server. It could be encrypted, but it's not. Why? I don't know. I don't work for those companies, but maybe it has to do with something how fast they can move data around the cloud. Obviously, the more stuff we put into it, right? Going up to the second line up there, extensive use of encryption, there's a cost to encrypting everything. Right? We can make networks so secure that we physically can't do anything when a problem comes up. It's possible to do. Is it effective? Not if there's a problem, right? I mean, I did, I've seen a network on, on a secret side where they actually have conduit welded all the way down to the routers so nobody can access the cable to splice the wire to put in the tap and pull the data off the wire. If I have a cable break on that, it's going to take me a lot longer to fix that or to check and validate the cable just from a physical layer standpoint, right? So the more security I put in there, yes, the more difficult things get to troubleshoot. If I have seven different devices in line, all with different rules, right, IDS, IPS, Web access firewall, yada, yada, yada. And I need to know which one of them let the packet through or let the attack through. That can be a problem. And okay, did it get through here? Did it get through here? Did it get through here? I have to have all that instrument and be able to find out or at least set up a test to be able to validate that. It all takes more time. Is there another hand up question? Yes. So uh, the second one, extensive use of encryption, that I assume is that of expensive cost for putting in a PKI. So I, I just find that to be an incredible number, the fact that even net of putting in a PKI is still the second most bank in the Well, it, it is, but think about this as well, right? So I, if I have to go in and find out what records were actually taken off of something, and my encryption is so good, I don't have, I don't even have the keys for it. I, they don't exist. How do I know what was actually taken out of that? I may not have to say, well, I don't know exactly. Potentially, guess what, guess what I have to do from a compliance point of view if I don't know what was exactly taken? What do I have to say? Does anybody want to guess? Possibly everything. That, that's why that Experian breach was so big and keeps getting bigger. They said 48 million records were possibly stolen right off the bat. That number's growing and growing and growing because they literally have no clue. Now, I don't work there, so I'm guessing. I'm inferring right now. They literally have no idea what was taken. 
they, they probably saw a large volume of traffic. I know this user hit this server. I see a large spike in data going out. The logs say they accessed it, yada, yada, yada. I have no idea if they took Jason Cornwell's information, Jeff Gibson's information, what they took. For a breach like that, and, and you see a spike on uh, uh, so, so, it's so large, why can't they just stop it almost instantly? So the question is, if you see a large spike, why can't you stop it almost instantly? It's a good question. Um, let's, let's bring that back in just a minute, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll come back, we're not holding to that. Let's, let's bring that back in just a minute, because I have a couple more slides I want to talk to you about. What's that? If you go back one slide, it says it takes 191 days to discover. Well, that's true. So they don't, most, of the, most of these breaches nobody knows about for three to six months before they even occur, and then they go, oh, it's too late. Well, right, so let's think, of, well, let's think about that attack cycle, right? So a user's going to probe and come in, start doing some lateral movement, right? Um, eventually, something's going to happen that's going to exfiltrate data off the network. That's going to happen sometime in there, but when that happens, and we'll come back to say why they can't, but even if you could stop it right away, how long does it take an actual person, number one, to notice it? So who's going to notice it, number one? The SOC, the knock, right? Security Operations Center. Who's manning that SOC? Is it your best and brightest, typically? No, somebody. It's a level one guy that knows, oh crap, there's an alarm. I gotta call somebody. Okay, so this is the work. We're already, time's ticking now, right? Time's ticking. Time's ticking, I gotta call somebody. They're probably asleep. Or maybe it's during the middle of the, heck, maybe it's during the middle of the day, there's not a huge spike, right? Maybe it's during legitimate traffic, most likely. But, but again, it's just gonna keep adding more and more time, so something's gone at that point already, as well. Even when we put it on automation, something's gone. And a smart guy's gonna do, or a smart guy or gal's gonna do something where I don't, try to trigger some large alarm. I'm gonna do it low and slow and take a long time. Be smart, right? I'm gonna be really smart and methodical about it. It's gonna take forever, right? Going back to my, my, one of my first slides, my young kid, he's probably gonna do that large spike because he doesn't know any better yet. When he gets to be about my age, if he, if he were still doing it, yeah, he'd probably be low and slow, right? A little better. So, right, any other questions? I know we spent a long time on this slide, but uh, a lot of stuff. So is it responsive? We'll talk about this, because this is where capture really comes in um, and for forensics. Again, making sure that team is fully instrumented in there. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So typical security workflow, right? Sort of a, sort of a triangle. We're gonna try to prevent anything from coming in or leaving our network. If something does, we're going to hopefully identify it, whether that's I found out right now or Oh my God, a new zero day, right? Came out and I need to go patch everything or update. We're gonna hopefully remediate that or put in some steps to remediate it, which will hopefully prevent it. And if not, again, we're just gonna continue around the cycle, around the cycle, around the cycle. So what are some of those things we use within that cycle? Some of the different technologies. So uh, we took, so beyond we do what's called a state of the network. Now, this is based on network and security teams so this is what we found typically for security incidents. 30% of, it's, it's, it's funny, only 30% of people said they use uh, syslog as, as the main driver. I think that number's a lot higher personally. I don't know anybody who doesn't use syslog, it's just there, it, it's ubiquitous. I, I don't know, maybe it's the way they ask the question. Um, but long-term packet capture and analysis was the second highest with 23%. I do tend to believe that number because I'm out there in the field and I know the, the number of my customers that don't have a long-term Capture solution, almost all of them have a short term, right? There's a problem going on. Great, break out Wireshark on my laptop. I'm gonna go see what's going on. Security team, I need to capture this upgrade. Let's do a TCP dump. Let's pull those packets. Well, what happened an hour ago? I don't know. Uh, using SNMP, some NetFlow again for those, those statistical, uh, you know, how much traffic moved somewhere or another. Maybe some other things. Uh, is there, are there any major things I'm missing on here? That, that, just as from a technology, not a specific vendors or anything, right? Anything stick out as missing? No? Good. Good. There's like no Windows logs. No Windows logs. <laughs> that was, uh, oops, I'm going the wrong way here. That was covered in the system. That's probably, but no, that should be a log. Some type of log, right? Application. All right. What's that? Application logs. Well, logs. Yeah. From the application. From the application. From the application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a syslog. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely different types of, any type of logging app. If, if you're not doing it, 
I don't know why not. It, it, it's, it's great, a lot of information, but there are some weaknesses. So I, I, I tend to put these things into, into three different things, right? A monitor, a troubleshoot, and forensic investigations. So monitoring, right? we, we're monitoring. Who's seen that commercial uh, for one of the security companies where the guys are robbing the bank and the security guards on it, eating a donut while they're doing it, and somebody asks them, why are you gonna do anything? They're like, no, you're being robbed, I'm just a monitoring system. Call the security company, right? That's what monitoring does, it lets us know something's going on. No, no remediation, it's just there to, to let us know what's going on. Metadata is fantastic for that. We'll talk about what metadata is in a second, but metadata is great, high level statistics. Syslogs are pretty good for it. Deep packet inspection from a, just a straight monitoring standpoint, you yeah, can do it, but it's not the best. Going over to troubleshooting, you can do some troubleshooting with metadata. Probably not the best, best thing for your buck in troubleshooting, but it'll at least get you in the general vicinity. You know, any type of log, and I include any type of log with systems log. Um, and, and packets, I can get down to root cause analysis typically with syslog and packet, one or the other, or both, maybe. And then getting into forensic investigations. Um, metadata is pretty good. Can let me know that Jason touched this computer over here, right? If he touched this computer, I moved X number of files. Syslogs are pretty good. Yeah, I saw user XXX access this specific file set, or maybe this application, but. Deep packets, DPI, deep packet inspection in forensics, one of the only things admissible in court up there for this data. You're not going to admit my metadata shows, well, great. The user touched something, and you're saying, you're saying he broke into Buckingham Palace and stole the crown jewels, but all you can say is he bought a ticket for, for Buckingham Palace. It's actually the Tower of London where those sit, but you get the gist, right? Versus here's a video of you going in, taking the crown jewels out, walking out with them. That's what the packets are going to do. So allowing that type of evidence in there. So we'll talk about each one of these real quick. Metadata, right? I never metadata. Add a little humor in there. Right? Never metadata, I didn't like that. <laughs> Everybody gets it. Okay, I know, wah, wah, cheesy, cheesy. <laughs> metadata is great, though. It really is. Your biggest bang for a buck on from a troubleshooting and just getting, wanting to get an 80% solution of what's going on, where is there an anomaly, what's normal, right? Behavioral type analysis. That's getting into metadata. Large, large statistical things, deviations, et cetera. Very easy to aggregate, aggregate across large organizations. Um, I want long-term trending and planning, right? I'm not gonna hold 14 years worth of packet level data anywhere. That's gonna be a ginormous source solution that's just gonna cost a fortune. But for metadata, I wanna know who talked to who for years. Absolutely, I can do that. Again, challenges though, lack of granularity. As we start getting to larger and larger time periods, that granularity goes down, right? Um, from a monitoring point of view, I always like to put out for metadata, you may be pulling something through SNMP every five minutes for interface statistics, right, for my networking people, and it shows 20% utilization. Is that good or bad? <coughs> Can anybody tell me is 20% utilization across the circuit over five minutes good or bad? Yeah, I love it, I like the way you think, it depends. What if, what if it was jammed out at 100% for a minute, possibly dropping all kinds of traffic, and the other four minutes, it wasn't used at all? It's gonna tell me it was 20% utilized, right? So again, starts to, to lose some of that granularity, and, and really lacks the why. Why did something happen? Why did they try to get in there? Why did they get it? Syslogs. And this is this one. Again, if you're not there, WMI logs, application logs, right there, ubiquitous. Every device out there has some type of log, PowerShell, API that you can get into and pull data from, and I'm putting all that sort of in here together, right? Easy to obtain, the vendors typically publish what, what's there. I can bring it into large solutions that I can scroll through, put it into a data lake, mirror data from here, there, everywhere. But it can be difficult to leverage, right? Um, to get down into the actual problem solving. It really can. And then packet analysis. Strengths. I have, if I had, and again, everybody see my funny, my funny does the captain's log, right? And again, I, that's where I put logs. They're about like that. They're big, they're heavy, they're wood. And it's All right, so I put, pack, I, I put this network representative, one simply doesn't, you know, blame the network for packets. It's typically the network team where I see 
provides a lot of packet has the longer term packet storage type solution security does too um, and i'm seeing it more and more historically in the past though years ago um, you know four three four five years ago it was the network team that would be providing packet traces to the security team or an application person from from say a tcp dump off of the server but they are the highest fidelity of data that i can get right the, the packets don't lie as a friend of mine bohan uh, used to say the packets don't lie the packet is what it is. You can say it, this didn't happen, but here's the data coming across the network or coming across the wire or wherever. It happened. It actually happened. So not only is it the highest fidelity, but I can, text I can contextually see what happened. What else happened? Right, what else did they do? The challenge though, a whole lot of packets can be really difficult to sort through. Uh, Steven, my, my Wireshark guy, how long can packet analysis take? Uh, is it easy or tedious from, from a Wireshark point of view? If you, if you even sort of don't know what you're doing. Yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, it's going to be a bad time. <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing, it's going to be a bad time. Is it super fast if you know what you're doing? It's pretty quick if you have an idea of what you're looking for. What if you just have a large pile of packets and say, here's my problem? Yeah, then probably not so much. <laughs> it's probably not so much, right? I, I mean, I've seen trace files of, of tens of gigs where customers sit in and say, hey, hey my problem's in here, go fix it. Okay, what were you trying to do? I was trying to access the, the application. All right, well, I see about 2,000 servers in here. Can you help me out a little bit? Which, what were you trying, what was your IP? What's an IP? Oh my God. <laughs> now, now we're in a whole nother world. All right. So, security forensics, right? I, I said this a minute ago. Backstop for your security efforts. Um, it's not just one thing in, in, in IT, or IT and security, right? Um, it, it's a little bit of everything, right? Putting in our IDS, yeah, we're, we're going to get, we're, we're going to be secure. Having an IPS, we're going to be a little more secure. Having, you know, a uh, business continuity management system where if one site gets hacked, I have it over another site. Or if I've thrown storage up into the cloud, so that if I have to, by God, if I get hit by a ransomware and I have to reimage everything, I can pull that back down and do it. Um, it it's just adding everything up into into one larger solution. We become more and more secure. I think everybody can understand that. But, I'm going to wait to show this slide. From an actual spend, does anybody want to guess what percentage of annual security spending is spent on investigation and remediation solutions such as packet capture? Pretty small. I'll give that as a percent. I don't want to guess how many dollars. It's more than one. It's more than two. I do have a percent. So about 2%, right, spent on forensic investigation versus an all, well, two to 300 million versus an almost $11 billion spent on the castle walls, right, the glorious castle walls that we put in marble and painted frescoes on and made monuments to mankind. But only 2% of our, our spend has been, well, what happens if somebody gets by? Because we all like to think, Everybody likes to think it's not going to happen. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be us. And then bam, you get Target. Then you get City of Atlanta. Then you get Home Depot, Panera Bread. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on, right? It happens to everybody. And the reason a lot of them, again, are hit so hard is because they don't have that top number one fully implemented, whether that's people or tools. And most of the time, it's tools. I, I got people that know how to do a forensic investigation. I've got Sam Davis from the FBI on speed dial. He's my best friend. He does everything for free for us. But by God, if I can't get the data, or I don't know what was taken and lost, what do I have to say? Everything, everything right? That's what you're going to say. Well, now you can ask your I question. I have to ask the question. Yeah. I mean, because I love the, the capsule wall analogy, like especially as a former military guy myself. But like, I have to, I have to ask, like in all seriousness, is the castle wall even really a thing anymore? Ah, the question is, is the castle wall even really a thing anymore? It's a good question, right? What is the castle wall now with, with how many applications out there in the, in the uh, how many services in the cloud, right? That's where you're going, right, with the cloud? Man, can, we, can we even approach it that way anymore? Or do we have to it's a great question. reinvent the way we think about this? Do we have to reinvent the way we, I think we do. Um, I mean, you can think of it as a, Here's my, my main castle, and I have all these little outposts, but oh my god, I've got potentially thousands of them now that I have to protect and 
Do I even have access to go protect them? They're in somebody else's kingdom. They're going to allow me to come across and build a border, right? What can I actually do inside of Amazon to go see what they're doing with their backend database, right? That I have no access to other than I put up, you know, application X, Y, Z, and they're providing the pipes. Hey, Jason, that's the exact, that's the exact uh, reason for the analogy. Yeah. yeah, we don't have castle walls now, um, and you know, literally, uh, because now you know they're outdated. I mean, it, it, you know, catapult's gone. You, know, you you try other ways. The security world is always changing. What worked last week is not going to work next week you know, as well. So it's, it's continually moving, and, and when you have no idea what's coming, that's that's the security of uh, that, that Jason's talking about. Is if you have that traffic, they may tunnel it under a different protocol now, or they may break it up in smaller pieces and put it uh, at a different point in the packet. But you can they may encrypt it all over the evidence and go in and forensically analyze it after the fact. So, I mean, it's kind of what you're asking, but yeah, things are changing. And, and the thing that's not changing is it's going across the wire. If you can have it, then you're able to dig into it later. One of those things I would put out. It, it, it'd be much akin to like an application development, right? How do I even know what I have to secure out there unless I know what's even out there? And how do I know what's out there unless I can go back and take a look what all has gone out there? Or I deploy an application out there, what all is popular? There are ways to deploy capture in the cloud, everybody, just so you know. You can absolutely do it. It may not be economical to pull all the data back into your network, because I'll tell you what, if anybody doesn't know already, the way all those uh, cloud providers make their money is when you pull data out of the cloud. You start getting charged an arm and a leg for that, for that data. It's great to put data in. When you have to pull it out, that bill's going up and up and up and up. Yes, sir. So if you have end users who are listening to you and saying, yep, I'm going to do everything over an encrypted line and make sure that little bad lock layer, HTTPS and stuff like that, in order to capture that, you have to either tear down the encryption <coughs> and build it back up out the door, or you have to be an intermediate on the encryption chain. What are you uh, talking about? This, what approach are you talking about? So the question was, let's say you've done it where everything is secure, right? Everything's encrypted everywhere. How do you how do you get the data, right? How do you look into the data even? Um, that's a great question. With with some of the newer encryption technologies, I don't know. You know, there there are SSL decryptors out there. I think some of them are about to become very outdated, right? With, with some of the new uh, SSL encryption technologies that are out there today. Um, it's a great question. For those companies that do decryption technology, we are not a decryption technology, by the way, Viavi. We are a packet capture, forensics, both security network performance and uh, performance side, right? We rely on getting that data in. Now, yes, we can if we, so certain technologies that have been around for a while, we have an SSL search we can bring in, we can absolutely decrypt it. What we're not doing, we're not decrypting anything in line. That's that's for other companies out there, right? That's for them to figure out. Um, we do what we do very well. I don't even want to attempt to start getting into SSL decryption. That's that's not what we do. That's for them to decide. But you're absolutely right. That, that goes to what I said before, that we can make it so, so encrypted, right? We can encrypt our, our traffic network so, so well. Oh my God, I over encrypted it now. I, I have no way to troubleshoot, no way to see what was actually taken. By God, I have to start up ground zero again and just say everything was taken, re-image everything, and you know, being made yeah. Yeah. So, um, by getting all this information, do you think that my data and documents that inside a car, is it 100% protected? Or is there a way that I can encrypt my data that's inside a car, or what's your answer? Yeah, so the question is, can you be 100% certain if uh, the data I put into the cloud is encrypted? I would say absolutely not. I mean, it's that I put up earlier, almost 90% of all traffic stored in the cloud is stored without at-rest encryption. So if I were to put any file out there and I didn't encrypt it, I have to assume it's not being encrypted, that, that anybody could potentially read it. Right, I think a uh, previous slide I got up there said 18% uh, of all files were right about out in the cloud, had some type of uh, violation, policy violation, and one in five of those is viewable publicly without even doing any sort of hacking in anything. So you gotta assume there's, there's what, 4% uh, chance if you were just to put a file up in the cloud on somebody's services that anybody, me, could go do a Google search possibly and go, go find it. 
and it was not encrypted, it's in clear text, we can go look at it. So should you encrypt it? Absolutely, I would zip that file up and encrypt it, do everything I could to it. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I brought this back up just again to, again, just different things we can, we can work on. I knew I had this written somewhere, um, I had it in my notes here. So those average, uh, you know, I said the average number of cloud services, the average enterprise use just over a, a thousand, right? Anybody want to guess what the number one line of business that uses those cloud services are within a uh, organization? The department? Any guess? IT. I know. IT is one of the smallest. You, you said IT. We'll, uh, we'll come back to that. Do you want to guess how many IT actually uses on average? The IT department as a whole. Actually, it's growing as a service now. It is growing. It is growing. HR is probably the biggest group. You got HR, yep, with 98 on average. IT is on average about 25 across the, across the U.S. About 25 cloud services that IT as a whole uses. Right? It, it's funny, uh, just a, a real quick story for, uh, for Viavi. When we, uh, we first moved to Salesforce, we'd have our own internal CRM tool that, <laughs> that we use, and everybody complained, oh my god, it's slow, it's the worst thing in the world, right? It's, it's terrible. So we moved to salesforce.com, cloud-based service. And it's right about the time when these started getting real popular, being able to do everything off of your phone, right? There's search, ask, bill form, and everything. Or, you know, traveling a lot on the road just with my laptop. People started calling into our IT department from their own personal cell phone that's not issued by the corporation, accessing directly through a Starbucks web connection, going out to salesforce.com and saying, Oh my God, IT, fix salesforce.com. It's slow. Do you want to guess what IT said to them? What the hell is salesforce.com? We, we don't have salesforce.com. Oh yeah, we do. Our VP of sales said we're going to go to salesforce.com because we forgot to do. We forgot to tell IT about it, right? Shadow IT, it exists, it's there. It's there. So from the security point of view, oh my God, I don't even know we're running these services and there's files being put out there, right? It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. All right. So let's get down. And I can't believe I've already gone 45 minutes, and I've only drunk like a third of my beer. So let's keep me talking. All right. All right. No, it's all good. It's all good. We'll uh, we'll we'll finish up here real quick. So let's talk security forensics again. The packets don't lie. So let's get down to the meat of this. I know that took a while to get down to. Um, we're we're a packet-based company, so I'm going to talk about packets, right? So again. As my friend Bohan said, the packets don't lie. They are the network fingerprints. They're that unique idea of what exactly happened out there. They answer those questions of who did it? What was it? When did it happen? What was the impact? What else happened? How did it happen? How did they get in? Oh my God, did they tunnel through the what? You know, what was inside that tunnel? And best of all, we can reconstruct exactly what happened. Provided our, our encryption and security is not too far down the road that we actually can't get into there to figure it out. Right? But we can, we can reconstruct a whole lot of events. All right, so security operations. We need to leverage that insight into the packet. When a breach occurs, we must be prepared to deliver a quick answer to some of these questions right here. Again, is the ones we just saw. What was compromised? What data was exposed, right? Because if we can't say what data was exposed, we have to say potentially everything was exposed. Who is responsible for the vulnerability, right? Not only who, but, but what device. How is the, has the breach ever been resolved? Right? I need to be able to go back and retest that to make sure it, it actually happened. That, that by God, that, that firewall, I named some vendors, but there's vendors in here that I've seen in the past and I don't want them to hate me. Um, I'm not picking on anyone in particular because I've seen stuff like this from almost everybody, but I've seen a firewall before say it's dropping or blocking packets and you put an analyzer on either side of it and by God, those packets are getting through that firewall. Call up the, the vendor. Now there's nothing wrong there. Well, well, here's the level of code it's on here, the, the trace files. And the next patch, suddenly it's gone, right? I mean, it seriously fixes itself kind of deal sometimes, right? It happens. But, uh, you know, we need to make sure that the breach has been, been, been fixed and can a resolution be validated? All part of that has the breach been resolved. All right. So let's talk uh, some next gen uh, approaches to attack remediation through packets here as well. All these down. I think that one did. All right. So, getting that full attack context, everything around it, the path, the identity, who was compromised, what was there. Investigate, isolate those attacks with post-event 
filtering and triggering, triggering some expert analyses. These are all designed around, again, packet capture. I know you all have tools that do a lot of this stuff, but again, the more sources of information we have, the better, right? The more we can, we can tri triangulate, the better, right? Again, validating our security tool effectiveness. Um, number one, what attacks have gotten through? How many false positives have we all got from security tools though? Hey, there's a problem over here, go look, go look, go look. But we don't have the, you know, that, that deep pattern of inspection to go validate, was it a true event or not? We think it was, but maybe it wasn't, right? So then integrating traffic access into existing security tools. Russell, it's always great to be able to integrate multiple tools together. These are some must-haves, I think, when you're looking at uh, packet remediation. Bringing, bringing data together is always a great thing. I know I'm running out of time. Um, this slide basically says the same thing, so I'm gonna follow this on. All right, so some of the security challenges also involve network teams, right? Uh, I grew up as a network engineer initially, and Yavi, historically, we have dealt with, with the network engineering side uh, in the past, because that's where performance has been, right? The network is slow, the network is slow, the network is slow, that's where most packet capture's happen. But again, in the last few years, we've seen a shift to the security team leading these packets. But again, part of our state of the network, we do look at a lot of uh, network teams. I just like to put these stats out there, right? Uh, network teams typically, 85% of the time, are involved in security investigations, so don't forget, excuse me, your networking brethren out there. Uh, they can provide valuable insight. A lot of times they will have tools. In fact, uh, we're seeing more and more organizations purchasing uh, the security and the networking team going in on purchases of forensic capture appliances because it does benefit both organizations. In fact, it's amazing the number of organizations where one side doesn't even know the other side has something like that because they just don't talk enough to each other. Security team may have you know, a large uh, semantic deployment of some type of capture and, and analysis and then the network team has a large packet capture analysis and metadata solution as well. Potentially could use one, both, who knows, right? Um, no, 50 per, that, that was an interesting one. 50% of the network teams are, are involved in validating the network tool effectiveness, or the security tool effectiveness and configurations, right? It's kind of interesting to me. Um, just, just very interesting out there, right? So I won't read all the rest. 44% uh, of the people of the network teams cited the inability to replay anomalies and events. Right? We know an attack happened, but we can't even replay it. We can't see exactly what was happening. It's always interesting. All right, so finishing up here, looking at the clock, five steps of threat resolution, right? Number one, capture everything on your network, right? At a minimum, at a minimum, if we're looking from just the compliance and, and what do we need to even disclose, we should start at the edge, right? Number one is typically our, our smallest bandwidth pipe out there, right? Much less bandwidth in the data center, so it's a much smaller appliance that we need. Um, or, or set of data, right? Set of storage for, for longer and longer term storage, right? So monitor from the, from the edge, or I, I have it here from, I put that backwards, I meant from the edge to the core. Start at the edge at least, and then as we get more into the core, what do we need to protect? Well, I always say the crown jewels, right? I made a mistake once of asking uh, somebody, a network person, what's the most important application on your network? Let's start there, you know, well, all of them are, it depends, right? It depends question. Well, what, what are the crown jewels of the business, right? Is it the Coca-Cola secret formula? Right? Is, is it the Colonel spicy chicken recipe? What is it? Let's protect that first and then start moving out farther and farther as we start deploying the solution. And most importantly, top left, never miss a single packet. This is big because there are a lot of capture solutions out there. And a lot of them tout different speeds and feeds. We connect, and you gotta watch the language, we connect at 100 gig. We connect at 20 gig, we are 10 gig compliant. What the heck does that mean? You have a 10 gig interface on your product? Well, what good does that do if I'm pushing you 30 gigabits per second of data, but you can only write to disk one gigabit per second? Or the hardware we configured on our homegrown platform is generic uh, consumer grade drives that are designed really for the home user that accesses their computer a couple hours a day, maybe doing some downloading and surfing the web versus an industrial grade drive that's spinning 24-7, writing, writing to the disk at 40 gigabits per second, right? Can I trust the fidelity of the capture I have? My laptop, I can guarantee you my laptop will not capture more than 125 gigabits per second. I've done it, I've, I've investigated it. Wireshark has lied to me on that. Wire, I, I've pushed 
a, a full gig of data to my laptop with, with the generation tool, and Wireshark said it captured 100% of the packets. And yet the data rate it was capturing at was 124 megabits per second. Had no idea. Had no idea it was even dropping traffic, and the reason being, it was dropping them at the NIC. It wasn't even getting into the application to tell me it dropped anything. So again, the fidelity of your capture, the hardware that it's on, it's, it's paramount. Because if I don't have all the traffic, am I sure that nothing got out? Am I sure that's all the data they access, right? It's there. So one of the biggest things, never miss a single packet. Number two, detect an alert on suspicious anomalous behavior. You can do this with tools we have today, right? IDS, IPS, um, whatever, but being able to do it from a packet level as well. Um, you know, what are the trends? What are the actual packets? Do I want to set specific offsets, filters, et cetera? Do that, why not? I'm getting the packets. Let's have another, another source of data for that, right? Turn back the clock using back in time functionality. So being able, again, the event happened, who knows, how much storage do I want in my organization, right? The average threat takes 191 days to detect. Do I want 191 days worth of packet, full, full payload packet storage? Well, that's gonna cost me X. That's now a business decision. If we're pushing this much data to it, we're gonna need this much storage. Maybe a week works, maybe three months. Yes, sir? That's the average, what are the extremes? That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, so the question was, average is 191 days, what are the extremes from, for detection? There's probably people out there that have been, had somebody on their network for years that have no idea they're there. Maybe they're not even doing anything, but they still have some type of bot out there or some type of backdoor in, right? I don't know. Maybe my son just decided to try hacking though and he gets caught like that. So I mean, your stream could be right away versus, shoot, you may never know, right? That, that, those averages we saw before, 51% of all companies globally have been, had some type of data breach in the last five years. I bet that number's way higher. I bet it's significantly higher. Number one, because not everybody told the truth in that, right? I guarantee you there's some people that said, no, we didn't, and they did. But I guarantee you there's people that have had a breach that they don't know yet, right? They still don't know, so that number's significantly higher. But wouldn't it be great if there was a breach, oh my God, the breach happened last night at 6 a.m. or last week at 3, 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, could we turn back that clock and not only see through that metadata of, oh my God, yes, there it is, and I see this guy talking to him, and them, and her, but I could actually pull that data back. Here are those packets, boom, boom. What do I do with them now? Well, it may take me a few days to go through them, or maybe a few hours if I, you know, just got my master's. Uh, but, but having them is key. So being able to turn back that clock, pull out those packets, start that investigation, at the time of the incident, and then if I need to go back even farther, well, when did they get on the network? Maybe I can go see, right? Start throwing in some of those uh, regular expressions, hex offsets, right? What am I looking for, right? Looking for patterns. Again, identify security threats. So again, we have those packets, now we identify those security threats. Perform packet pre-processing, eliminate obfuscation techniques. Again, some of these are built into certain tool sets, some aren't. Depending on the tool you get, Wireshark, it's pretty good. I love Wireshark, it's great at what it does. But, you know, it's not designed specifically around security. I think it's that's great. Again, how am I gonna do that? Maybe through snort, maybe through filtering. Just a number of ways to do this. And then view that list of behavior into or out of the network, right? What actually truly came in? Rebuild those conversations, whether that's in the ladder bounce chart diagram, as you see here, right? Here's the packet as it left the network, here's the sin, act, here's the data as it goes. Here's that DNS request going out to badguy.com, at badguy.com, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, credit card number, right? It, people have heard about that, right? Being able to send out malicious information through DNS. Anybody not ever heard about that? Had, I, I had a customer where that was happening. They had a large number of DNS queries going out to, to various servers across the globe, and it was actual PCI information in that, you know, Jason Cornwell at badguy.com is the first one, the second one's actual credit card number, the third one's the expiration date. If that's sent out low and slow, nobody's ever gonna see that, right? I mean, it's just, what did I see? Great. Um, whoops, wrong way. And then being able to, you know, possibly rebuild conversations, pull out files, the actual files themselves, the PDFs, the Word documents, whatever was taken. Being able to reconstruct those through the packets as a part of that viewing that illicit behavior into and out of the network. Okay. 
All right. So, again, new things we need to understand network application travel patterns. I know I'm going really fast now because uh, we're about out of time and I want to get to one more slide. Um, these are some of the things you should expect in a hardware appliance, right? High speed, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, and I mean actual data write rates when you're doing everything on that appliance, not just we are capable of connecting a 10 gig, 20 gig, 40 gig, there's no 20 gig connection, but multiple 10 gig, right? 40 gig, 100 gig. You can actually write those rates down so that you're not bamboozled. I've, I've seen it before. There, there are vendors out there that say, we, yes, we are 40 gig capable, and they literally will not be more than six gigabits per second of write to disk on that appliance. Yeah, sure, you can connect at it, but you're dropping a whole lot of traffic if you're pushing any more than six gigs at it, especially if you turn on advanced features. Like expert, you know, expert analytics on there, metadata creation, et cetera. It's all there. So, so just just be aware. Um, by the way, for, for anybody curious, that that one uh, customer I have in Georgia, uh, I can't give their name, but the amount of data that they were pushing to their capture appliance on average, or appliances, I should say, uh, it, it averaged about 1.2 gigabits per second per day, 24 by 7. If you average it out, they needed six petabytes of storage to get a year's worth of data on, the, on that data coming into and out of their network, just coming into and out of their, out of their WAM, right, going out to the globe. So it can get pretty big pretty fast. They could have lessened that by, by again, cutting the payload, but then it, it invalidates what they wanted. They wanted to see the, the payload of the packet was coming into and out of their network, so. So with that being said, I'm at 815. I thank you all. Any, any other questions real quick? Any, any, yes, sir. What are the implications of having a long-term packet storage on things like European cell types? Ooh, good question. What are the implications of having long-term packet storage on European type privacy issues? That's a great question. Um, for those of you who don't know, in Europe, they're, they're pretty concerned about privacy. For example, in Germany, it, if you want them to view NetFlow level data, you can't even see people's IP addresses that they have, even if it's not tied back to a user. You have to obfuscate that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it really depends on country by country. And there's certain things you can do uh, number one, a lot of times it gets, you get around it by being able to encrypt the data at disk. So that's another thing I should have said. In your hardware solution, make sure they're capable of encrypting data at rest on the disks themselves, whether that's home built or bought uh, from a vendor. Make sure, as well, if you're going to buy it from a vendor, you understand the implications of performance if you turn on that, that encryption at rest, because some of them do it in software, and some of them do it in hardware where it doesn't affect that right to disk rate at all. right? So just be aware of that. Um, but other things you may have to do, you may have to mask certain fields, depending on, on the, the country you're in. And there are, uh, typically you do that packet broker. So things like a, a Gigamon, an, an ACA, an Arista. Uh, depending on what, what advanced feature modules they have, they can mask certain data fields. So you can get around some of that via, via that. It just kind of, it, it really depends on the, on the country over there. Some of them are tighter. They're not all the same, exactly, right? 